Zoom has gotten sophisticated since the advent of COVID-19. When Holly started using it, in February of 2020, which seems much longer than 17 months ago, it was apt to drop the connection if you so much as looked at it cross-eyed. Sometimes you could see your fellow Zoomers, sometimes you couldn't, sometimes they flickered back and forth in a headache-inducing frenzy. Quite the movie fan is Holly Gibney. Although she hasn't been in an actual theater since the previous spring, and she enjoys Hollywood tentpole movies every bit as much as art films, one of her faves from the 80s is Conan the Barbarian, and her favorite line from that film is spoken by a minor character. Two or three years ago, the peddler says of Set and his followers, they were just another snake cult. Now they're everywhere. Zoom is sort of like that. In 2019, it was just another app, struggling for breathing room with competitors like FastTime and GoToMeeting. Now, thanks to COVID, Zoom is as ubiquitous as the snake cult of set. It's not just the tech that's improved, either. Production values have, as well. The Zoom funeral Holly is attending could almost be a scene in a TV drama. The focus is on each speaker eulogizing the dear departed, of course. But there are also occasional cuts to various grieving mourners in their homes. Not to Holly, though. She's blocked her video. She's a better, stronger person than she once was, but she's still a deeply private person. She knows it's okay for people to be sad at funerals, to cry and choke up, but she doesn't want anyone to see her that way, especially not her business partner or her friends. She doesn't want them to see her red eyes, her tangled hair, or her shaking hands as she reads her own eulogy, which is both short and as honest as she could make it. Most of all, she doesn't want them to see her smoking a cigarette. After 17 months of COVID, she's fallen off the wagon. Now, at the end of the service, her screen begins showing a kinescope featuring the dear departed in various poses at various locations while Frank Sinatra sings, Thanks for the Memory. Holly can't stand it and clicks leave. She takes one more drag on her cigarette, and as she's butting it out, her phone rings. She doesn't want to talk to anyone, but it's Barbara Robinson, and that's a call she has to take. You left, Barbara says. Not even a black square with your name on it. I've never cared for that particular song. And it was over anyway. But you're okay, right? Yes. Not exactly true. Holly doesn't know if she's okay or not. But right now, I need to. What's the word that Barbara will accept? That will enable Holly to end this call before she breaks down? I need to process. Understood, Barbara says. I'll come over in a heartbeat if you want, lockdown or no lockdown. It's a de facto lockdown instead of a real one, and they both know it. Their governor is determined to protect individual freedoms, no matter how many thousands have to sicken or die to support the idea. Most people are taking precautions anyway, thank God. No need for that. Okay. I know this is bad, Holes. A bad time. But hang in there. We've been through worse. Maybe. Almost certainly. Thinking about Chet Ondowski, who took a short and lethal trip down an elevator shaft late last year. And booster vaccines are coming. First, for people with bad immune systems and people over 65. But I'm hearing at school that by fall it'll be everyone. That sounds right. Holly says. And bonus? Trump's gone. Leaving behind a country at war with itself, Holly thinks. And who's to say he won't reappear in 2024? She thinks of Arnie's promise from the Terminator. I'll be back. Holes? You there? I am. 
just thinking. Thinking about another cigarette, as it happens. Now that she started again, she can't seem to get enough of them. Okay. I love you, and I understand you need your space, but if you don't call back tonight or tomorrow, I'll call you again. Fair warning. Roger that, Holly says, and ends the call. She reaches for her cigarettes, then pushes them away and puts her head down on her crossed arms and begins to cry. She's cried so much lately. Tears of relief after Biden won the election. Tears of horror and belated reaction after Chet Ondowski, a monster pretending to be human, went down the elevator shaft. She cried during and after the Capitol riot. Those were tears of rage. Today, tears of grief and loss. Except they are also tears of relief. That's awful, but she supposes it's also human. In March of 2020, COVID swept through almost all of the nursing homes in the state where Holly grew up and can't seem to leave. That wasn't a problem for Holly's Uncle Henry, because at that time he was still living with Holly's mother in Meadowbrook Estates. Even then, Uncle Henry had been losing his marbles, a fact of which Holly had been blissfully unaware. He'd seemed pretty much okay on her occasional visits, and Charlotte Gibney kept her own concerns about her brother strictly to herself, following one of the great unspoken rules of that lady's life. If you don't talk about something, if you don't acknowledge it, it isn't there. Holly supposes that's why her mother never sat her down and had the conversation with her when she was 13 and started to develop breasts. By December of last year, Charlotte was no longer able to ignore the elephant in the room, which was no elephant but her gaga older brother. Around the time Holly was beginning to suspect Chet Ondowski might be something more than a local TV reporter, Charlotte enlisted her daughter and her daughter's friend Jerome to help her transport Uncle Henry to the Rolling Hills Elder Care Facility. This was around the time the first cases of the so-called Delta variant began to appear in the United States. A Rolling Hills orderly tested positive for this new and more communicable version of COVID. The orderly had refused the vaccinations, claiming they contained bits of fetal tissue from aborted babies. He had read this on the internet. He was sent home, but the damage was done. Delta was loose in Rolling Hills, and soon over 40 of the oldies were suffering various degrees of the illness. A dozen died. Holly's Uncle Henry wasn't one of them. He didn't even get sick. He had been double-vaxxed, Charlotte protested, but Holly insisted. And although he tested positive, he never got so much as the sniffles. It was Charlotte who died. An avid Trump supporter, a fact she trumpeted to her daughter at every opportunity. She refused to get the vaccinations or even to wear a mask. Except that was at Kroger in her local bank branch, where they were required. The one Charlotte kept for those occasions was a bright red with MAGA stamped on it. Mm. On July 4th, Charlotte attended an anti-mask rally in the state capitol, waving a sign reading my body, my choice, a sentiment that did not keep her from being adamantly anti-abortion. On July 7th, she lost her sense of smell and gained a cough. On the 10th, she was admitted to Mercy Hospital, nine short blocks from Rolling Hills Elder Care, where her brother was doing fine. Physically, at least. On the 15th, she was placed on a ventilator. During Charlotte's final, brutally short illness, Holly visited via Zoom. To the very end... Charlotte continued to claim that the coronavirus was a hoax, and she just had a bad case of the flu. She died on the 20th, and only strings pulled by Holly's partner, Pete Huntley, prevented her body being stored in the refrigerated truck that was serving as an adjunct to the morgue. She was taken to the Crossman Funeral Home instead, where the funeral director had quickly arranged the Zoom funeral. A year and a half into the pandemic, he had plenty of experience in such televised final rites. Holly finally cries herself out. 
She thinks about watching a movie, but the idea has no appeal, which is a rarity. She thinks about lying down, but she slept a lot since Charlotte died. She supposes that's how her mind is dealing with grief. She doesn't want to read a book either. She doubts if she could keep track of the words. There's a hole where her mother used to be. It's as simple as that. The two of them had a difficult relationship which only got worse when Holly started to pull away. Her success in doing that was largely down to Bill Hodges. Holly's grief was bad when Bill passed. Pancreatic cancer. But the grief she feels now is somehow deeper, more complicated because Charlotte Gibney was. Tell the truth and shame the devil, a woman who specialized in smother love. At least when it came to her daughter. Their estrangement only got worse with Charlotte's wholehearted embrace of the ex-president. There had been few face-to-face -face visits in the last two years. The final one on the previous Christmas, when Charlotte cooked all of what she imagined were Holly's favorite foods, every one of which reminded Holly of her unhappy, lonely childhood. She has two phones on her desk, her personal and her business. Finders Keepers has been busy during the time of the pandemic, although investigations have become rather tricky. The firm is shut down now, with messages on her office phone and Pete Huntley saying the agency will be closed until August 1st. She considered adding because of a death in the family and decided that was no one's business. When she checks the office phone now, it's only because she's on autopilot for the time being. She sees she's gotten four calls during the 40 minutes while she was attending her mother's funeral. All from the same number. The caller has also left four voicemails. Holly thinks briefly of simply erasing them. She has no more desire to take on a case than she has to watch a movie or read a book. But she can't do that any more than she can leave a picture hanging crooked or her bed unmade. Listening doesn't render an obligation to call back, she tells herself, and pushes play for the first VM. It came in at 1-2 p.m., just about the time the last Charlotte Gibney show got going. Hello, this is Penelope Dow. I know you're closed, but this is very important. An emergency, in fact. I hope you'll call me back as soon as possible. Your agency was suggested to me by Detective Isabel Janes. That's where the message ends. Of course, Holly knows who Izzy Janes is. She used to be Pete's partner when Pete was still on the cops, but that isn't what strikes her about the message. What hits, and hard, is how much Penelope Dahl sounds like Holly's late mother. It's not so much the voice as the palpable anxiety in the voice. Charlotte was almost always anxious about something, and she passed on that constant gnawing to her daughter like a virus. Like COVID, in fact. Holly decides not to listen to the rest of anxious Penelope's messages. The lady will have to wait. Pete sure isn't going to be doing any legwork for a while. He tested positive for COVID a week before Charlotte died. He was double vaxxed and isn't too sick. Says it's more like a heavy cold than the flu. But he's quarantining and will be for some time to come. Holly stands at the living room window of her tidy little apartment, looking down at the street and remembering that last meal with her mother. An authentic Christmas dinner, just like in the old days. Charlotte had said, cheery and excited on top, but with that constant anxiety pulsing away underneath. The authentic Christmas dinner had consisted of dry turkey, lumpy mashed potatoes, and flabby spears of asparagus. Oh, and thimble glasses of Mogan David wine to toast with. How terrible that meal had been, and how terrible that it had been their last. Did Holly say I love you, Mom, before she drove away the next morning? She thinks so, but can't remember for sure. All she can remember for sure is the relief she felt when she turned the first corner and her mother's house was no longer in the rearview mirror. Holly's left her cigarettes by her desktop computer. She goes back to get them, shakes one out, lights it, looks at the office phone in its charging cradle, 
sighs, and listens to Penelope Dell's second message. It starts on a note of disapproval. This is a very short space for messages, Mrs. Gibney. I'd like to talk to you or Mr. Huntley, or both of you, about my daughter Bonnie. She disappeared three weeks ago on the 1st of July. The police investigation was very superficial. I told Detective Janes that, write to her. End of message. Told Izzy right to her face. Holly says, and jets smoke from her nostrils. Men are often captivated by Izzy's red hair. Salon enhanced these days, no doubt. And her misty gray eyes women less frequently. But she's a good detective. Holly has decided that if Pete retires, as he keeps threatening to do, she'll try to lure Isabel away from the cops and over to the dark side. There's no hesitation about going to the third message. Holly has to see how the story ends. Although she can guess, chances are good that Bonnie Dahl is a runaway, and her mother can't accept that. Penelope Dahl's voice returns. Bonnie is an assistant librarian on the Bell campus. At the Reynolds? It opened again in June for the summer students. Although, of course, you have to wear a mask to enter. And I suppose soon you'll have to show a vaccination card as well. Although so far they haven't... Message ends. Would you get to the point, lady? Holly thinks and punches up the last one. Penelope talks faster, almost speed rapping. She rides her bike to and from her job. I've told her how unsafe that is, but she says she wears her helmet, as if that would save her from a bad crash or getting hit by a car. She stopped at the Jet Mart for a soda, and that's the last. Penelope begins to cry. It's hard to listen to. Holly takes a monster drag on her cigarette, then mashes it out. The last time she was seen. Please help. Message ends. Holly has been standing, holding the office phone in her hand, listening on speaker. Now she sits and slots the phone back in its cradle. For the first time since Charlotte got sick. No, since the time when Holly realized she wasn't going to get better, Holly's grief takes a back seat to these bite-sized messages. She'd like to hear the whole story or as much of it as anxious Penelope knows. Pete probably doesn't know either, but she decides to give him a call. What else does she have to do? Except think about her last few video visits with her mother and how frightened Charlotte's eyes were as the ventilator helped her breathe. Pete answers on the first ring, his voice raspy. Hey, Holly. So sorry about your mom. Thank you. You gave a great eulogy. Short but sweet. I only wish I could have. He breaks off as a coughing fit strikes. Only wish I could have seen you. What was it, some kind of computer glitch? Holly could say it was, but she makes it a habit to tell the truth except on those rare occasions when she feels she absolutely can't. No glitch. I just turned off the video. I'm kind of a mess. How are you feeling, Pete? She can hear the rattle of phlegm as he sighs. Not terrible, but I was better yesterday. Jesus. I hope I'm not going to be one of those long haulers. Have you called your doctor? He gives a hoarse laugh. I might as well try to call Pope Francis. You know how many new cases there were in the city yesterday? 3,400. It's going up exponentially. There's another coughing fit. Maybe the ER? I'll stick with juice and Tylenol. The worst part of it is how fucking tired I am all the time. Every trip to the kitchen is a trek. When I go to the bathroom, I have to sit down and pee like a girl. If that's too much information, I apologize. It is, but Holly doesn't say so. She didn't think she had to worry about Pete. Breakthrough cases usually aren't serious, but maybe she does have to worry. 
Did you call just to bat the breeze, or did you want something? I don't want to bother you if... Go ahead, bother me. Give me something to think about besides myself. Please. Are you okay? Not sick. I'm fine. Did you get a call from a woman named Penny Dowell? Right? She's left four messages on my company voicemail so far. Four on mine, too. You didn't get back to her? Holly knows he didn't. What she knows is this. Anxious Penelope looked on the Finders Keepers website, or maybe Facebook, and found two office numbers for two partners, one male and one female. Anxious Penelope called the male because when you've got a problem, an emergency, she termed it, you don't ask for help from the mayor, at least not at first. You call the stallion. Calling the mayor is your fallback position. Holly is used to being the mayor in the finder's keeper's stable. Pete sighs again, producing that disturbing rattle. In case you forgot, we're closed, Holes. And feeling like shit? As I currently do, I didn't think talking to a weepy-ass divorced mom would make me feel any better. Having just lost your own mom, I don't think it would make you feel any better, either. Wait until August. That's my advice. My strong advice. By then, the girl may have called Momsy from Fort Wayne or Phoenix or San Fran. He coughs some more, then adds, Or the cops will have found her body. You sound like you know something, even if you didn't talk to the mother. Was it in the paper? Oh, yeah, it was a big story. Stop the presses extra, extra, read all about it. Two lines in the police beat between a naked man passed out on Cumberland Avenue and a rabid fox wandering around in the city center parking lot. There's nothing else in the paper these days except COVID and people arguing about masks which is like people standing out in the rain and arguing about whether or not they're getting wet. He pauses, then adds rather reluctantly, The lady's voicemail said Izzy caught the squeal, so I gave her a call. Smiles have been in short supply for Holly this summer, but she feels one on her face now. It's nice to know that she's not the only one addicted to the job. It's as if Pete can see her, even though they're not zooming. Don't make a big deal of it, okay? I needed to catch up with Iz anyway, see how she's doing. And, COVID-wise, she's fine. Shit-canned her latest boyfriend is all, and I got a fair amount of wah wah away about that. I asked her about this Bonnie doll. Izzy says they're treating it as a missing persons case. There are some good reasons for that. Neighbors say Dahl and her mother argued a lot. Some real blowouts. And there was a bow-by note taped to the seat of Dahl's ten speed. But the note struck the mom as ominous and Izzy as ambiguous. What did it say? Just three words. I've had enough. Which could mean she left town or, or that she committed suicide. What do her friends say about her state of mind? Or the people she works with at the library? No idea, Pete says, and starts coughing again. That's where I left it, and it's where you should leave it, at least for now. Either the case will still be there on August 1st, or it will have solved itself. One way or the other, Holly says. Right one way or the other. Where was the bike found? Mrs. Dale said her daughter got a soda at Jet Mart the night she disappeared. Was it there? Holly can think of at least three Jet Mart convenience stores in the city, and there are probably more. Again, I have no idea. I'm going to lie down for a while. And again, I'm sorry your mother passed. Thanks. If you don't start to improve, I want you to seek medical attention. Promise me. You're nagging, Holly. 
Yes. Another smile. I'm good at it, aren't I? Learned at my mother's knee. Now promise. Okay. He's probably lying. One other thing. What? She thinks it will be something about the case. That's already how she's thinking of it, but it's not. You'll never convince me that this COVID shit happened naturally, jumping to people from bats or baby crocodiles or whatever in some Chinese wet market. I don't know if it escaped from a research facility where they were brewing it up or if it got released on purpose, but as my grandfather would have said, taint natural. Sounding kind of paranoid there, Pete. You think? Listen, viruses mutate. It's their big survival skill. But they're just as apt to mutate into a less dangerous strain as one that's more dangerous. That's what happened with the bird flu. But this one just keeps getting worse. Delta infects people who've been double-vaxxed. I'm a case in point. And people who don't get really sick from Delta carry four times the viral load as the original version, which means they can pass it on even more easily. Does that sound random to you? Hard to tell, Holly says. What's easy to tell is when someone is riding a hobby horse. Pete is currently aboard his. Maybe the Delta variant will mutate into something weaker. We'll find out, won't we? When the next one comes along. Which it will. In the meantime, shelve Penny Doll and find something to watch on Netflix. It's what I'm going to do. Probably good advice. Take care, Pete. With that, she ends the call. She doesn't want to watch anything on Netflix. Holly thinks most of their movies, even those with big budgets, are weirdly mediocre. But her stomach is making tiny, tentative growls, and she decides to pay attention. Something comforting. Maybe tomato soup and a grilled cheese sandwich. Pete's ideas about viruses are probably internet bull poop, but his advice about leaving Penelope Pennydale alone is undoubtedly good. She heats the soup. She makes the grilled cheese with plenty of mustard and just a dab of relish. The way she likes it, and she doesn't call Penelope Dowell. At least not until seven that night. What keeps gnawing at her is the note taped to the seat of Bonnie Dale's bicycle. I've had enough. There were lots of times when Holly thought of leaving a similar note and getting out of Dodge, but she never did. And there were times when she thought of ending it all, pulling the pin. Bill would have said, but she never thought of it seriously. Well, maybe once or twice. She calls Mrs. Dahl from her study, and the woman answers on the first ring, eager and a little out of breath. Hello? Is this Finder's Keepers? Yes. Holly Gibney. How can I help, Miss Dow? Thank God you called. I thought you and Mr. Huntley must be on vacation or something. As if, Holly thinks. Can you come to my office tomorrow, Mrs. Dow? It's in. The Frederick Building, I know. Of course. The police have been no help at all. Not at all. What time? Would nine o'clock suit you? Perfect. Thank you so much. My daughter was last seen at four minutes past eight on July 1st. There's video of her in a store where she... We'll discuss all that tomorrow, Holly says. But no guarantees, Mrs. Dow. It's just me, I'm afraid. My partner is ill. Oh my God, not COVID. Yes, but a mild case. Holly hopes it's mild. I only have a few questions for you now. You said on your message that Bonnie was last seen at a jet mart. There are quite a few of them around the city. Which of them was it? The one near the park. 
on Red Bank Avenue. Do you know that area? I do. Holly's even gotten gas at that jet mart a time or two. And was that where her bike was found? No, further down Red Bank. There's an empty building. Well, there's a lot of empty buildings on that side of the park. But this one used to be a car repair shop or something. Her bike was on its kickstand, out in front. No attempt to hide it? No, no, nothing like that. The police detective I talked to, the Janie's woman, said Bonnie might have wanted it found. She also said the bus and train depot is only a mile further along, right about where you get into downtown. But I said Bonnie wouldn't leave her bike and then walk the rest of the way. Why would she? I mean, it stands to reason. She's ramping up, getting into a hysterical rhythm Holly knows well. If she doesn't stop the woman now, Holly will be on the phone for an hour or more. Let me stop you right there, Miss Dale. Penny. Call me Penny. Okay, Penny. We'll get into it tomorrow. Our rates are $400 a day, three-day minimum, plus expenses, which I will itemize. I can take Master or Visa or your personal check. No Amex. There, poopy is the word that comes naturally to Holly's mind. They're difficult to deal with. Are you willing to proceed on that basis? Yes. Absolutely. No hesitation at all. The Janie's woman asked if Bonnie was feeling depressed. I know what she was thinking about. Suicide is what she was thinking about. But Bonnie is a cheerful soul. Even after her breakup with that dope, she was so crazy about... She got back on the sunny side after the first two or three weeks. Well, maybe it was more like a month, but... We'll talk tomorrow, Holly repeats. You can tell me all about it. Fifth floor. And Penny? Yes. Wear a mask. A 95? If you have one? I can't help you if I get sick. I will. I absolutely will. May I call you Holly? Holly tells Penny that would be fine and finally extracts herself from the call. Mindful of Pete's suggestion, Holly tries a Netflix movie called Blood Red Sky, but when the scary stuff starts, she turns it off. She has followed all the bloody exploits of Jason and Michael and Freddy. She can tell you the names of every movie in which Christopher Lee played the sanguinary count. But after Brady Hartsfield and Chet Ondowski, especially Ondowski, she thinks she may have lost her taste for horror films. She goes to the window and stands there looking out at the lightning day, ashtray in one hand, cigarette in the other. What a nasty habit it is. She's already thinking about how much she'll want one during her meeting with Penny Dale, because meeting new clients is always stressful for her. She's a good detective, has decided it's what she was born to do, her calling, but she leaves the initial meet and greets to Pete whenever possible. No way she can do that tomorrow. She thinks about asking Jerome Robinson to be there but he's working on the editor's draft of a book about his great-grandfather, who was quite a character. Jerome would come if she asked, but she won't interrupt him. Time to suck it up. No smoking in the building, either. I'll have to go out to the alley on the side once the doll woman's gone. Holly knows this is how addicts think and behave. They rearrange the furniture of their lives to make room for their bad habits. Smoking is rotten and dangerous. But there's nothing more comforting than one of these deadly little tubes of paper and tobacco. If the girl took the train, there'll be a record even if she paid cash. Same with Greyhound, Peter Pan, Magic Carpet, and Lux. But there are two fly-by-nighters on the next block that specialize in transient travel. Tri-State? And what's the other one? She can't remember and she doesn't want to do an internet search tonight. 
Plus, who's to say that Bonnie Dow left on a bus or Amtrak? She could have hitchhiked. Holly thinks of it happened one night and how Claudette Colbert gets a ride for her and Clark Gable by hiking up her skirt and adjusting a stocking. Things don't change that much. Only Bonnie Dow didn't have a big strong man to protect her. Unless, of course, she'd reconnected with the old boyfriend her mom had mentioned. No point picking at this now. There will probably be plenty to pick at tomorrow. She hopes so. Anyway, Penny Dahl's problem will give her something to think about besides her mother's pointless politics-driven death. I have Holly Hope, she thinks, and goes into the bedroom to put on her pajamas and say her prayers. September 10, 2015 Carrie Dressler is young. Unattached. Not bad-looking. Cheerful, rarely prone to worrying about the future. He's currently sitting on a rocky outcrop covered with initials, high on good grass and sipping a pico while he watches Raiders of the Lost Ark. On a weekend, this outcrop, known as Drive-In Rock, would be crowded with kids drinking beer, smoking weed, and grab-assing around, but this is a Thursday night, and he has it all to himself. Which is how he likes it. The rock is on the west side of Deerfield Park, near the edge of the thickets. This area is a tangle of trees and undergrowth. From most locations therein, it would be impossible to see Red Bank Avenue, let alone the Magic City drive-in screen, but here, a ragged cut runs down to the street, maybe caused by flooding or a long-ago rock slide. Magic City is barely hanging on these days. Nobody wants to swat bugs and listen to the soundtrack on M radio when there are three cineplexes spotted around the city all with Dolby sound and one even with Imex, which is kicking. But you can't smoke weed in a Cineplex. On Drive-In Rock, you can smoke all you want. And after an eight-hour shift at strike em out Lanes, Carrie wants. There's no sound, of course, but Carrie doesn't need it. Magic City shows strictly second, third E. And fourth-run movies these days and he's seen Raiders at least ten times. He knows the dialogue and murmurs a snatch now, between tokes. Snakes? Why did it have to be snakes? Raiders will be followed by Last Crusade, which Carrie has also seen many times. Not as many as Raiders, but at least four. He won't stay for that one. He'll finish his pico, get on his moped. Now stashed in the bushes near the park entrance closest to drive in rock and ride home. Very carefully. His current joint is down to a nubbin. He butts it on the outcrop between Beedigal and Mandy Sucks. He stores the roach, inspects the contents of his fanny pack, and debates between a skinny J and a fatty. He decides on the J. He'll smoke half of it, eat the Kit Kat bar also stashed in his fanny pack, then put put his way back to his apartment. He gets lost in the bright images playing out a quarter of a mile away and ends up smoking almost all of it. He hears the John Williams music in his head and vocalizes, keeping it on the down low in case anyone else is nearby. Unlikely at 10 p.m. on a Thursday night, but not impossible. Zoom de doom doom. Zoom de da. Zoom de boom zoom. Zoom day. Carrie stops abruptly. He just heard a voice. Didn't he? He cocks his head to one side, listening. Maybe it was his imagination. Dope doesn't ordinarily make him paranoid. Only mellow, but on occasion. He's about decided it was nothing when the voice speaks up again. Not close, but not all that far away either. It's... The battery, hun. I think it's dead. There's nothing wrong with Carrie's eyesight, and from his vantage point he quickly spots the location of that voice. Red Bank Avenue will never be in the running as one of the nicest streets in the city. There are the thickets on one side, crowding the few paths and pushing through the wrought iron fence. On the other are warehouses, a U.S. store at Outfit, 
a defunct auto repair shop, and a couple of vacant lots. One of those was home to a bedraggled little carnival that picked up stakes after Labor Day. In the other, next to a long deserted convenience store, is a van with the side door open and a ramp sticking out. There's a wheelchair next to the ramp with someone in it. I can't stay here all night. The wheelchair occupant says, she sounds old and wavery, a little irritated and a little scared. Call for help. I would, says the man with her, but my phone is dead. I forgot to charge it. Do you have yours? I left it home. What are we going to do? It won't occur to Carrie until later, too late to do any good that the woman in the wheelchair and the man with her are projecting their voices. Not much, not yelling or anything, but the way actors on stage project for the audience. Later, he'll realize that he was the audience they were playing to, the guy sitting on drive and rock with the joint winking on and off like a locator beacon. Later, he'll realize how often he stops off here for a while on his way home from the bowling alley, smoking a dube and watching the movie across the way. He decides he can't just sit there while the old guy goes off looking for help, leaving the woman alone. Carrie is your basic good person, more than happy to do the occasional good deed. He makes his way down the slope, holding onto branches to keep from going on his ass. He gives his moped, faithful pony, a little pat as he passes it. When he reaches one of the Red Bank Avenue gates out of the park, he walks down the sidewalk until he's opposite the van. He calls, Need a little help? It won't occur to him until later, in the cage, to wonder why they picked that particular place to park. An abandoned quick pick store is hardly a beauty spot. Who's there? The man calls, sounding worried. Name's Carrie Dressler. Can I... Carrie? My goodness, hon, it's Carrie. Carrie steps into the street, peering. Small ball? Is that you? The man laughs. It's me, all right. Listen, Carrie, the battery in my wife's wheelchair died. I don't suppose you could push it up the ramp, could you? I think I can manage that. Carrie says, crossing the street. Indy Jones to the rescue. The old lady laughs. I saw that movie at the old Bijou. Thank you so much, young man. You're a lifesaver. Roddy Harris is telling his wife how he and their rescuer know each other. Carrie grabs the wheelchair hand grips and aims the chair for the ramp. Small Ball stands back to give him room one hand in the pocket of his tweed jacket. Carrie is so high that he doesn't even feel the needle when it goes into the back of his neck. July 23, 2020, 1. Holly arrives at the 4th Street Municipal parking lot half a block from the Frederick Building and swipes her card. The barrier goes up and she drives in. It's 8.35, um, almost half an hour before the appointed time for her meeting with Penny Dahl, but the doll woman is also early. There's no mistaking her Volvo. It has large photos of her daughter taped to both sides and the back. Printed across the rear window, probably a moving violation, Holly thinks, is, have you seen my daughter and Bonnie Ray doll and call 216-55-00019. Holly parks her Prius next to it, which isn't a problem. There's no shortage of spaces in the lot. It used to be packed by nine, with the sorry full sign out front, but that was before the pandemic. Now, large numbers of people are working from home, assuming they still have jobs to work at. Also assuming they are not too sick to work. The hospitals emptied out for a while, but then Delta arrived with its new bag of tricks. They aren't at capacity yet, but they're getting there. By August, patients may be bedding down in the halls and snack stations again. Because Mrs. Dahl is nowhere in sight, and Holly is early, 
She lights a cigarette and walks around the Volvo, studying the pictures. Bonnie Dahl is both pretty and older than Holly expected. Mid-twenties, give or take. She guesses it was partly the thing about Dal riding her bike to and from the Reynolds Library that made Holly expect a younger woman. The rest was how much Penny Dahl's voice reminded Holly of her late mother. She supposes she thought Bonnie would look sort of like Holly had at 19 or 20. Pinched Emily Dickinson face. Hair pulled back in a bun or ponytail. Fake smile. Holly had hated having her picture taken, still does. Clothes designed not just to minimize her figure, but to make it disappear. This girl's face is open to the world, her smile wide and sunny. Her blonde hair is short, cut off in front in a shaggy, sun-streaked fringe. The pictures on the sides of the car are full-face portraits, but the one on the back shows Bonnie astride her bike, wearing white shorts with V-cuts on the sides and a strappy top. No body consciousness there. Holly finishes her cigarette, bends, scrapes it out on the pavement. She touches the blackened tip to make sure it's cold, then places it in the litter basket outside the swing gate. She pops a lifesaver into her mouth, puts on her mask, and walks down to her building. Penny Dahl is waiting in the lobby, and even with the mask, Holly sees the resemblance to her daughter. Holly puts her age at 60 or thereabouts. Her hair might be pretty with a touch-up, but now it's rat fur gray. Neatly kept, though, Holly adds to this first assessment. She always tries to be kind. Mrs. Dahl's clothes are clean but slapdash. Holly is no fashionista, far from it, but she would never put that blouse with those slacks. Here is a woman for whom personal appearance has taken a back seat. Across the requested 95, in bright red letters, is her daughter's first name. Hello, Miss Dal, she says. Holly Gibney. Holly has never liked shaking hands, but she offers an elbow willingly. Penny Dale bumps it with her own. Thank you so much for seeing me. Thank you so very, very much. Let's go upstairs. The lobby is empty, and they don't have to wait for the elevator. Holly pushes for the fifth floor. To Penny, she says, we had some trouble with this darn thing last year, but it's fixed now. Without Pete or Barbara Robinson helping out, or just hanging out, the reception area feels like a held breath. Holly starts the coffee maker. I brought pictures of Bonnie, a dozen, all taken within a year or two of when she disappeared. I've got tons more, but from when she was younger. And that's not the girl you'll be looking for, is it? I can send them to your phone if you give me your email address. Her delivery is staccato and she keeps touching her mask to be sure it's in place. I can take this off, you know. I'm double vaxxed and COVID negative. I took the home test just last night. Why don't we wear them out here? We'll take them off in my office and have some coffee. I have cookies if Barbara, the young lady who sometimes helps out, hasn't eaten them all. No, thank you. Holly doesn't have to look to know they're all gone anyway. Barbara can't keep her hands off the vanilla wafers. I saw the pictures of Bonnie on your car, by the way. She's very attractive. Penny's eyes crinkle as she smiles behind her mask. I think so. Of course, I'm her mother, so what else would I say? No Miss America, but she was a prom queen back in high school. And nobody dumped a bucket of blood on her, either. She laughs, the sound as sharp as her delivery. Holly hopes she isn't going to get all hysterical. After three weeks, the woman should be beyond that, but maybe not. Holly has never lost a daughter, so she doesn't know. But she does know how she felt when she thought she might have lost Jerome and Barbara. Like she was going out of her mind. Holly writes her email address on a post-it. Are you married, Mrs. Dull? 
Dal pastes the note inside the cover of her phone. If you don't start calling me Penny, I may scream. Penny it is. Holly says partly because she thinks her new client actually might. Divorced. Herbert and I dissolved our partnership three years ago. Political differences were part of it. He was all in on Trump, but there were plenty of other reasons as well. How did Bonnie feel about that? Handled it in very adult fashion. And why not? She was an adult. 21. Besides, the first time Herbie came home wearing a MAGA hat, she actually laughed at him. He was displeased. Here's another relationship chilled by the fast-talking man in the red tie. It's not fate and not coincidence. Meanwhile, the coffee is ready. How do you like it, Penny? Or I have tea, and there might be a Poland water, unless Peter Barbara. Coffee's fine. No cream? Just a little sugar. I'll let you add that yourself. Holly pours into two of the Finder's Keeper's mugs, which Pete insisted on ordering. Without looking up, she says, Let's cross one tea right away, Penny. Is there any chance your ex-husband might have something to do with Bonnie's disappearance? The jagged laugh comes again, nerves rather than amusement. He's in Alaska, left for a white-collar job in a shipping plant about six months after the divorce. And he has COVID. His idol refused to wear a mask, so Herb refused to wear one. You know, Trumper see, Trumper do. If you're asking if he abducted his 24-year-old daughter or tempted her into moving to Juneau to live with him, the answer is no. He says he's getting better. This makes Holly think of Pete. But when I FaceTime him, it's all cough, cough, wheeze, wheeze, wheeze. Penny says this with unmistakable satisfaction. In Holly's office, they take off their masks. The client's chair probably isn't a full six feet away, but it's close. Besides, Holly tells herself, perfect is the enemy of good. She opens her iPad to the note function and types Bonnie Ray Dahol and 24-year-old and disappeared on the night of July 1. It's a start. Tell me about when she was last seen. Let's start with that. You said it was at a Jet Mart convenience store? Yes, on Red Bank Ave. Bonnie has an apartment in one of those new Lakeview condos. You know where the old docks used to be? Holly nods. There are several condominium clusters down there now and more under construction. Soon you won't be able to see the lake at all unless you own one. The Jet Mart is at the halfway point of her ride home. A mile and a half from the library, a mile and a half from her place. The clerk knows her there. She came in on July 1st at four minutes past eight. Jet Mart regular stop, Holly types. She hits the keys without looking, keeping her eyes on Penny. I have the security camera video. I'll send that to you, too. But do you want to see it now? Really? How did you get that? Detective Jane shared it with me. At your lawyer's request? Penny looks perplexed. I don't have a lawyer. I used one when I bought my house in Upriver, but not since. She gave it to me when I asked. Good for Izzy, Holly thinks. Should I have a lawyer? That's up to you, but I don't think you need one right now. Let's look at the video. Penny gets up and starts to come around the desk. No, just hand it to me. Double vax or not, home tested last night or not, Holly doesn't want the woman looking over her shoulder and breathing on the side of her face. It's not just COVID. Even before the virus, she didn't like strangers in her personal space. And that's what this woman still is. Penny opens the video and hands her phone to Holly. Just hit play. 
The security camera is looking down from a high angle, and it's far from crystal clear. No one has cleaned the lens in a long time, if ever. It shows the so-called beer cave, the clerk, the front door, the miserly parking area, and a slice of Red Bank Avenue. The timestamp in the lower left-hand corner reads 8.4 p.m. The date stamp in the right-hand corner reads 7.121. It's not dark yet, but, as Bob Dylan says, it's getting there. Plenty of light still left in the sky, enough for Holly to see Bonnie pull up on her bike, take off her helmet, and shake out her hair, which was probably sweaty. The last week of June and the first week of July were very hot. Poopy hot, in fact. She puts her helmet on the seat of her bike, but enters the store still wearing her backpack. She's in tan slacks and a polo shirt with Bell College above the left breast, and the Bell Tower logo above the words. The clip is soundless, of course. Holly looks at the little movie with the fascination she supposes anyone feels when looking at someone who went from a clean, well-lighted place into the unknown. Bonnie Ray goes to the back cooler and gets a bottle of soda. Looks like a Coke or Pepsi. On her way to the cash register, she stops to inspect the snack rack. She picks up a package. Might be ho haws Might be yodels. Doesn't matter, because she puts it back. And in Holly's mind, she hears Charlotte Gibney say, I must maintain my girlish figure. At the register, she has a brief conversation with the clerk, middle-aged, balding Hispanic. It must be something funny because they both laugh. Bonnie rests her pack on the counter, unbuckles the flap, and puts her bottle of soda inside. It's big enough for the shoes she wears at work, maybe, plus her phone and a book or two. She slides the straps back over her shoulders and says something else to the clerk. He gives her some change and a thumbs up. She leaves, puts on her helmet, mounts her bike, pedals away to wherever. When Holly looks up and hands back the phone, Penny Dale is crying. Tears are hard for Holly to handle. There's a box of tissues beside her mouse pad. She pushes it toward Penny without making eye contact, nibbling at her lower lip and wishing for a cigarette. I'm sorry. I know how hard this is for you. Penny looks at her over a bouquet of Kleenex. Do you? It's almost a challenge. Holly sighs. No, probably not. There's a moment of silence between them. Holly thinks of telling Penny she recently lost her mother, but it's not the same. She knows where her mother is, after all under dirt and sod at Cedar Rest. Penny Dale only knows there's a hole in her life where her daughter is supposed to be. I'm curious about your daughter's helmet. Was it with her bike when it was found? Penny's mouth falls open. No, just the bike. You know what? Detective Jane's never asked about that, and I never thought of it. Penny gets a pass. But Izzy Jane sinks a bit in Holly's estimation. What about her pack? Gone, but you'd expect that, wouldn't you? You might wear a pack after you got off your bike. She wore it into the store, but you'd hardly keep wearing your helmet, would you? Holly doesn't answer because this isn't a conversation. It's an interrogation. It will be as gentle as she can make it, but an interrogation is what it is. Catch me up, Penny. Tell me everything you know. Start with what Bonnie does at the Reynolds Library and when she left that evening. There are four assistant librarians at the Reynolds Library on the Bell College of Arts and Sciences campus. During the summer, the library closes at 7. The head librarian, Matt Conroy, sometimes stays until closing, but that night he didn't. Margaret Brenner, Edith Brookings, Lakeisha Stone, and Bonnie Dahl saw out the last few visitors by five past. 
Before locking, they split up and took a quick sweep through the stacks for anyone who either didn't hear the closing bell or chose to ignore it while reading one more page or taking one more note. Bonnie had told her mother that sometimes they found people fast asleep in the reading room or the stacks, and on a few occasions they came across couples who had been overcome with passion. In flagrant, delicious, she called it. They also checked the restrooms on the main level and on the third floor. That night, all the customers were gone. The four gabbed for a bit in the break room, discussing weekend plans, then turned out the lights. Lakeisha got into her smart car and drove away. Bonnie got on her bike and headed for her efficiency apartment, where she never arrived. Penny hadn't been very concerned when she called Bonnie the next morning and got voicemail on the first ring. I wanted to ask if she'd like to come over on Friday or Saturday night and watch something on Netflix or Hulu. Penny says, then adds, I was going to make popcorn. Is that all? Holly's nose for a lie isn't as strong as Bill Hodges's was, but she's good at knowing when someone's shading the truth. Penny colors. Well, we'd had an argument a couple of nights before. It got a little heated. Mothers and daughters, you know. Movies are how we make up. We both love the movies, and now there's so much to watch, isn't there? Yes, Holly says. I assumed she was on the phone with someone else and she'd call back. But there was no call back. Penny tried again at ten, then at eleven, with the same result. One ring and then voicemail. She called Lakeisha Stone, Bonnie's best bud on the library staff, to ask if Bonnie was still mad at her. Lakeisha said she didn't know. Bonnie hadn't come in that morning. That was when Penny began to get worried. She had a key to her daughter's condo apartment and drove there. What time was this? I was worried and not checking the time. I think around noon. I wasn't afraid she'd gotten sick with COVID or something else. She always takes precautions, and she's always been healthy. But I kept thinking about an accident like a slip in the shower or something. Holly nods, but is remembering the security video. Bonnie Ray wasn't wearing a mask when she went into the store, and neither was the guy at the register. So much for always taking precautions. She wasn't at her apartment and everything looked normal, so I drove to the library, really getting worried now. But she still wasn't there and hadn't called in. I called the police and tried to file a missing persons report, but the man I talked to, after being on hold for 20 minutes, told me that it had to be at least 48 hours for a teen minor or 72 hours for a legal adult. I told him how she wasn't answering her phone like it was turned off, but he didn't seem interested. I asked to speak with the detective, and he said they were all busy. At 6 that evening back home, Penny got a call from Bonnie's friend, Lakeisha. A man had arrived at the Reynolds with a blue and white Beaumont City, 10 speed in the back of his pickup. That kind of bike has a package carrier, to which Bonnie had pasted a bumper sticker reading I. Reynolds Library. The man, Marvin Brown, wanted to know if it belonged to someone who worked at the library, or maybe someone who used the library a lot. Otherwise, he said, he guessed he probably should take it to the police station because of the note on the seat. The note saying, I've had enough. Holly says, Yes. Penny's eyes have filled with tears again. But you wouldn't call your daughter suicidal? God, no. Penny jerks back as if Holly has slapped her. A tear spills down her cheek. God, no. I told Detective James the same thing. Go on. The staff all recognized the bike. Matt Conroy, the head librarian, called the police. Lakeisha called Penny. I kind of broke down, Penny says. 
Every Psycho Stalker movie I ever saw flashed in front of my eyes. Where did Mr. Brown find the bike? Less than three blocks down Red Bank from the Jet Mart. There's an auto repair shop for sale across from the park. Mr. Brown has a repair shop on the other side of town, and I guess he's interested in expanding. A real estate agent met him there. They examined the bike together. Penny swallows. Neither of them liked that note on the seat. Did you talk to Mr. Brown? No. Detective James did. She called him. No personal interview, Holly type still keeping her eyes on Penny, who is wiping away more tears. She thinks Marvin Brown may be her first contact. Mr. Brown and the real estate man discussed what to do with the bike, and Mr. Brown said, well, why don't I run it up to the library in my pickup? And after they looked the place over. The repair shop, I mean, that's what he did. Who was there first? Brown or the real estate agent? I don't know. It didn't seem important. It may not be, but Holly intends to find out. Because sometimes killers find the bodies of their victims, and sometimes arsonists call the fire department. It gives them a thrill. Any further development since then? Nothing, Penny says. She wipes her eyes. Her voicemail is full, but sometimes I call anyway. To hear her voice, you know. Holly winces. Pete says she'll get used to clients' tales of woe eventually. That her heart will grow calluses. But it hasn't happened yet, and Holly hopes it never does. Pete may have those calluses, and Izzy Jane's, but Bill never did. He always cared. He said he couldn't help it. What about the hospitals? I assume they were checked? Penny laughs. There's no humor in it. I asked the policeman who answered the phone. The one who told me all the detectives were busy. If he would do that, or if I should. He said I should. You know... Your runaway daughter, your job. It was pretty clear that's what he thought she was, a runaway. I called Mercy. I called St. Joe's. I called Kiner Memorial. Do you know what they told me? Holly is sure she does, but let's Penny say it. They said they didn't know. How's that for incompetency? This woman is distraught, so Holly won't point out what would have been obvious to her if her focus hadn't narrowed to exclude everything but her missing daughter. The hospitals here and all over the Midwest are overwhelmed. The staff has been inundated with COVID patients, not just the doctors and nurses, everyone. On the front page of yesterday's paper, there was a picture of a masked janitor wheeling a patient into the Mercy Hospital ICU. If not for the computerized record-keeping systems, the city's hospitals might have no idea of even how many patients they have in care. As it is, the information must be lagging well behind the flood of sick people. When this is over, Holly thinks, no one will believe it really happened. Or if they do, they won't understand how it happened. And since then, has Detective Janes been in touch? Twice? In three weeks, Penny says. She sounds bitter, and Holly thinks she has a right to be. Once she came to my house for ten minutes, the other time she called. She has Bonnie's picture and said she'd put it on NAMAS, which is a nationwide missing persons database, also on NCMEC. That's the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Holly says, thinking that was a good call on Izzy's part, even though Bonnie Ray Dahal isn't a child. Cops often post there if the missing person is young and female. Young females are by far the most common abductees. Of course, they're also the most common runaways. 
But, she thinks, if a 24-year-old woman decides to up stakes and start over somewhere else, you can't call her a runaway. Penny pulls in a shuddering breath. No help from the police. Zero. Jane says, sure. She might have been abducted, but the note suggests she just left. Only why would she? Why? She has a good job. She's in line for a promotion. She's good pals with Lakisha. And she finally dumped that loser of a boyfriend. What's the name of the loser boyfriend? Tom Higgins. She wrinkles her nose. He worked at the shoe store out at the airport mall. Then the mall closed down during the first COVID wave. He tried to move in with Bonnie to save on the rent, but she wouldn't let him. They had a big fight about it. Bon told him they were done. He laughed and said she couldn't fire him. He quit. Like it was original, you know. Probably he thought it was. Do you think he had anything to do with Bonnie's disappearance? No. She folds her arms across her chest as if to say that ends the subject. Holly waits. A technique Bill Hodges taught her. And Penny finally fills the silence. That man could barely blow his own nose without an instruction video. Also, very immature. I never knew what Bonnie saw in him, and she could never explain it. Holly, a fan of the hunks on Bachelor in Paradise, has a good idea what Bonnie might have seen in him. She doesn't want to say it and doesn't have to. Penny says it for her. He must have been terrific in the sack, a real 60-minute man. Do you have his address? Penny consults her phone. Two... 395 Eastland Avenue. Although I don't know if he's still there. Holly records it. Do you have a picture of the note? Penny does, says Lakeisha Stone photographed it when Marvin Brown brought the bike. Holly studies it and doesn't like what she sees. Block letters, all caps, carefully made. I've had enough. Is this your daughter's printing? Penny gives a sigh that says she's at her wit's end. It might be, but I can't be sure. My daughter doesn't do handwriting. None of them do these days except for their signatures, which you can barely read. Just scribbles. She doesn't usually print in all big letters, but if she wanted to be... I don't know. Emphatic? Yes. That. Then she might. She could be right, Holly thinks, but if that were the case, might she not have printed in even bigger caps? Nah, I'd, I've had enough, but I've had enough. Maybe even with an exclamation point or two. No, Holly doesn't care for this note at all. She's not ready to believe Bonnie didn't write it, but she's far from ready to believe that Bonnie did. Please forward this along with the photos of your daughter. What about you, Penny? Where do you live? Renner Circle. 883 Renner in Upriver. Holly adds it to her notes where she has also written P and B argued P. E says it got heated. And what do you do? I'm the chief loan officer at the Norbank branch on the Turnpike Extension at the airport. At least I was. And I assume I will be again. Norbank has temporarily closed three of their stores. We call them stores. And one of them was mine. Not working from home? No. I'm still getting paid, though. One ray of sunshine in all this. This mess. Which reminds me, I need to give you a check. She opens her bag and starts rooting through it. You must have more questions, too. I will have, but I've got enough to get started on. When will I hear from you? Penny is writing a check quickly and efficiently, not pausing at any of the fields. And not printing either, but writing in a small, rolling, tightly controlled script. Give me 24 hours to get going. 
If you find out something worth sharing before that, call. Anytime. Day or night. One more thing. Ordinarily, she shies from anything personal, especially if it might seem confrontational. But this morning, she doesn't hesitate. She's got hold of this now, like a snarled knot she wants to unpick. Tell me about the argument. The one that got heated. Penny once more folds her arms over her chest, more tightly this time. Holly knows defensive body language from plenty of personal experience. It was nothing. A tempest in a teapot. Holly waits. We argue from time to time. Big deal. What mother and daughter don't? Holly waits. Well, Penny says at last, this one was a little more serious, maybe. She slammed the door on the way out. She's a good-natured girl, and that was out of character. We had some, some warm discussions about Tom, but she never slammed out of the house. And I swore at her. Called her a stubborn bitch. God, I wish I could take that back. Just say, okay, Bon, let's forget about it. But you never know, do you? What was it about? There was an excellent position at Norbank. Records and inventory. Collating. Front office, working from home, guaranteed. How great does that sound with everything that's going on? I was trying to get her to apply for it. She's excellent with numbers and a real people person, but she wouldn't. I told her about the substantial pay jump she'd get, and the benefits, and the good hours. Nothing got through to her. She could be stubborn. Look who's talking, Holly thinks, remembering fights she had with her own mother, especially once she started working with Bill Hodges. There had been some doozies after she and Bill had almost gotten killed while chasing after a doctor who'd been possessed. There was really no other way to put it. By Brady Hartsfield. I told her if she worked at the bank, she could buy some decent clothes for a change and stop dressing like a hippie. She laughed at me. That's when I called her a bitch. Any other arguments? Sore spots. No. None. Holly knows she's lying, and not just to the private detective she's just hired. Holly types one more note, then gets up and puts on her mask. What will you do first? Call Izzy Janes. I think she'll talk to me. She and I go back quite a few years. And even before Brown, the pickup truck man, she wants to talk to Lakeisha Stone. Because if Lakeisha and Bonnie were besties, even closies, Lakeisha will have a better fix on how the mother and daughter got along. Doctor slamming argument or not, Holly doesn't want to start this by equating her own mother and Bonnie's too closely. You are not the case, Bill told her once. Never make the mistake of thinking you are. It never helps and usually makes things worse.